Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this important discussion where we will be covering how educators and parents can support student mental health amid COVID-19 restrictions. Joining us today for this chat are John Everett, who is uh, a middle school counselor at the Hong Kong International School, as is Laura Cowan. Uh, but John specifically focuses on social emotional learning and is a student life leader. And Laura is the middle school student support services team leader. So now before we really jump into this conversation, uh, John, we'll start with you. Could you just explain a little bit more about what you do specifically and what social emotional learning is? Sure, Clark. Thank you for having us. We're both very excited to be here. So my role as social emotional learning and student life leader uh, is uh, one that uh, is all about the student experience. And so I make sure that uh, everything we do, every class, every uh, extracurricular, uh, you know, lunchtime, we are always focusing on the whole child. So making sure that social and emotional lives are being nurtured. And then I also work with like our house system and our advisory system to make sure that they have all the supplies and resources they need. Thanks, John and Laura, over to you. Hi there, thanks for having us on. So in my role as the teacher leader, I oversee the mental health and wellbeing program of the students, the faculty, the parents. We have learner support teachers, as well as our three grade level counselors and our nurse. So that's kind of my tutelage where I'm supporting everybody um, in just our roles as providing support for the kids. Thanks, Laura. So now, as, as everyone in Hong Kong is obviously well aware, primary school aged children and under have had in-person classes halted uh, with an initial target to resume, resume after the Lunar New Year holiday, which uh, obviously looks unlikely as things currently stand. Uh, I should also note that we're filming this chat before the, the Lunar New Year holiday takes place. Uh, by the time this video is available for viewing, certainly there could be many changes that happen between now and then. But regardless of any changes that may or may not happen, uh, you know, our discussion today concerns student mental health amid COVID-19 restrictions and whether it's in person or online. Um, so with many students, uh, to, to start off, with many students now having to go back to online learning, uh, I wanted to start off by asking you both if you could share some of the steepest challenges that came about when it came to student mental health through 2020 and 2021, uh, you know, when, when this was the first time schools and students really had to deal with something like this. Uh, and now with having that experience in hindsight, what are some of those key lessons that you learned uh, that you're able to carry forward in this current situation? And then really any similar circumstances in the future? You know, just this morning, actually, uh, it was reported that the European Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong, they have a draft report saying that Hong Kong could still remain cut off for most of the world until about 2024, uh, believe it or not. That, that is something that they, they may be throwing out there. So mm -hmm. clearly th this is something, you know, that maybe was once thought of as a tiny blip in time, but, you know, is certainly not something that is going away anytime soon. So uh, maybe we can start with John on that. Yeah, uh, sure. Well, let's start with those challenges. And when I think back to when, you know, we're in our fifth time doing home learning now, so we hopefully um, figure out how to get through some of the challenges. But back to those very first days, I remember the, that sense of fear and uncertainty. You know, students were at home not knowing if their family was safe, not knowing if they should leave their home. And so there was this element of uh, everything felt unstable. And so we had to figure out how we could take something that feels unstable and give them something stable at school. Uh, and then another big challenge, uh, especially when we began, was being isolated from your social group. Uh, you know, many, many of our students, uh, because of that fear, didn't leave their home. And so they just had to figure out how to, to maintain their friend groups online, uh, which can be quite challenging. And so we had to help them with their isolation. Laura, what, what about some of the challenges uh, that you could describe? I think just adding on to what John was saying, uh, the kids feeling isolated, but also, you know, a lot of people live in small quarters in Hong Kong. And so having privacy to be able to just carry out your day to day routine and be online. Um, I think that kids like being away, particularly kids of this age, like being away from home and developing their identity. And so having that sort of not being able to connect with friends, I think that um, change fatigue as we went through you know, one schedule, another schedule, 
back in school, no back to home learning, that really did weigh heavily. And I think it took us a while to really understand how much that impacted our mental health and well-being. And I think more recently, when we look at students who have actually been placed in quarantine or who have been separated from their parents, that adds another big layer of um, sort of ongoing trauma fatigue and, and that instability. And so providing as many anchors as we can and as many support structures, like, for example, Zooming with kids who are in quarantine, keeping up their connections with school and with us helps at least lighten the burden and um, builds up some resiliency in, in their skill set. So really, I, you know, I think what both of you just said, all those challenges to me sound like those challenges probably still remain uh, uh, today with, with uh, new restrictions coming in. I, I would imagine all of those things are still relevant. And so, you know, what, what are the key lessons learned in dealing with those challenges, you know, the, the first few times around, uh, you know, what, what are the, the ways that you were able to, um, you know, what, what are you able to put forward with uh, having learned those lessons? Mm -hmm. Why don't we start with you, Laura? Okay, so I think that what we realized was that we really needed to focus on the psychological well-being, mental health and well-being. If you look at Maslow's hierarchy of self-needs, we need to have certain safety structures, stability, core, core stability, as well as just mental health and well-being before learning is going to actually take place. And so we really had to be mindful of how can we provide that, not just to the students, but to our faculty and to our parent with all of the changes and the turmoil that was going on. And we learned that we needed to be responsive in our teaching methods. A lot of what works in the classroom works over Zoom, but there's also an element of every teacher needed to be upskilled, needed to learn how to bridge that gap and meet both the academic needs, but also the social and emotional needs as well. And so we took a lot of time uh, doing offering trainings here at school uh, so that teachers were equipped in their classes. We learned that we needed to minimize those changes. What I was referring to earlier, that um, fear and uncertainty, you know, everything felt unstable. And so we needed to be stable at school. We couldn't keep making changes uh, and then in turn adding to that uncertainty. Uh, that idea of feeling socially isolated, uh, we actually took our, our schedule and changed it and added a time during the day for virtual clubs just for the chance for kids to socialize and get a chance to uh, be with like-minded people. And so we took some time out of the school day to make sure that um, the kids were uh, offered a chance to to get to know each other on that social uh, that social uh, kind of mindset. And then finally, we had to help kids learn that you know when you walk through the school gate, it does seem like you flick a switch, right? Okay, it's school time. Uh, but when you just roll out of bed and go to your desk, sometimes you don't go through that same transition. And so we had to help kids figure out ways to change their working space so that when they're uh, at home, it does feel like they're doing something different. And so we gave them a lot of guidance in setting themselves up for success in that way. That's interesting. I'm, I'm curious about the, the social hub. How, how does that work exactly? Yeah, like the social clubs. So um, we, we do have a clubs program already in the middle school and when we're in person, uh, but we change it from being at the end of the day to in the middle of the day. Uh, so it, it kind of became, it, it gave kids a chance to kind of have a break from all the academics. Uh, and then every teachers or students could sign up to run a club. And then those that were running it uh, would put their Zoom link out and then kids could pop in. Uh, and so like, you know, I did um, games with uh, Mr. Everett is what mine was. And so we'd pop in, we'd play Uno or something virtually and just kind of hang out with kids for 15, 20 minutes. And then they would go about their day. And there's like all sorts of clubs. Uh, some kids were getting together just to watch like basketball highlights, just whatever you're interested in. There was a club for you. And then you get to still socialize, even though you weren't face to face with each other. Oh, that's great. Uh, so I, I'm curious, I'm, I'm sure many parents uh, wonder, uh, when, whenever something like this happens, new restrictions come down from the government, uh, if you'd be able to offer a little bit of insight behind the curtain as to how educators really take on these challenges, what are the actual conversations being had? What, what goes into the decision-making process on how to move forward with practical coursework while still you know, always keeping mental health in mind for these students? Well, I think that the focus on mental health and well-being has had been embedded in our curriculum for several years. And so we just really had to upskill faculty on uh, sort of trauma-informed teaching practices so that they were aware of how certain behaviors might manifest themselves with all of these changes. And at the end of the day, our, our 
our teachers are really they're, they're consummate professionals they're able to adjust and adapt and tweak and they had to and don't get me wrong it was stressful and um, as you can imagine with any kind of change in short period of time and then another change but we are so impressed with how well they have handled that and managed that and at the end of the day when they get in front of screen with the kids there, there's something that switches on and they are just they're on themselves they're able to handle anything maneuver through things and because we have got such a good support system with like learner support teachers and counselors we're able to collaboratively collaboratively work together to support each other and just have really early intervention should there be some challenges that arise yeah and as laura is saying we have great professionals but we're they're also people and so mm -hmm. uh, as as the leaders of the school we got together and we had to brainstorm ways to help them get their needs met as people and mm -hmm. so part of that is just giving them permission to feel whatever they're feeling. You know, the same things we talk about with kids when we're talking about emotional awareness happens for adults too. And so we would have times where even during faculty meetings, we'd pop up like an emotions chart and encourage people to think through what they're feeling right now. Because there's this idea that uh, Dr. Dan Siegel came up with, if you name it, you can tame it. And so if you can name your emotion, you can do something with it. If it's a pleasant emotion, then you can do more of those things to get more of that pleasant emotion. If it's challenging, you can figure out a way to move forward. And so we gave plenty of space for people to be okay with whatever they're at and helping them become aware of their professional and personal needs. And then finally, uh, you know, we got some feedback from the faculty and from the kids of what was necessary in Zoom to be successful. And then we offered some targeted professional learning. Thanks, John. So I think at this point, you know, having dealt with it, <laughs> we're going, going into our, our third year now. I think it's gone from you know, kind of uh, seeing things through a, a bit of, you know, testing the waters, a bit of trial and error. I think it's gotten to the level of where parents might actually start having some true expectations of what they can hold their teachers and, and their schools accountable for when it comes to these measures, you know, being put into place, whether it's online learning or just dealing with anything that comes with COVID. So at, at this point, really, what, what should parents truly be expecting out of their educators when it comes to nurturing the, uh, you know, the mental health aspect of their children? I think that parents, um, again, because we have built up this parent partnership, and that's really important to us because we want to uh, educate uh, our, their children in tandem. And so I think that they, they know that it's it's a balance, right? It's a balance of both academics and the mental health and well-being. And, and that, you know, I think that there's a great quote, the definition of insanity was you keep doing the same thing over and over again, didn't expect different results, but we've kind of flipped that over with COVID. We had, to begin with, we were doing so many different things, but it's, you know, wondering what's going on. And now we kind of have reached a sort of happy medium where we've got the communication channels open. We know that we have to look at the mental health and well-being. We know that academics are critical. I'm a parent. Well, that was one of my concerns as well. How might these interruptions impact our child and, and or my child and our learning and the progress? But what we're seeing as we continually keep those channels open and we're refining things, that actually learning continues. But we must always keep that focus on that mental health and well-being of every member of our community. Yes, and I think that parents should also expect that the teachers are going to be doing everything that they can to nurture their whole child. You know, there are some complications with Zoom, but we're going to do our best. Mm -hmm. uh, some, you know, if they walk past their child as they're doing online learning, they might have some some things to listen for. Like, is the teacher making sure that everyone hears their uh, their name that day? You know, nothing says belonging like this person knows my name. Uh, is the teacher making sure that kids are getting a chance to share uh, their point of view so they feel like uh, their their voice matters? Is the teacher giving them time to leave their screen? Uh, you know, sometimes I think that it can be off-putting. Wait a minute, you're in school right now. Why are you over here, uh, you know, doing five jumping jacks? Get back to school. Uh, but that's all very important. That's the teacher being aware of uh, how much focus the kid can give and giving them a chance to refresh uh, and be able to come back and focus. Uh, they should be, uh, you know, looking for teachers to do emotional check-ins, see how their kids are feeling. Um, they should be looking for differentiation, like, uh, you know, uh, we we tell our we have our teachers do may do and must do lists. So like you know with online learning things can get done early, and if it gets gets done early, we want you to have some extensions. So every day you start class with what must be done and then what may be done, um, and then overall we we believe that by teachers take, taking this approach, it's going to provide that structure and those systems and stability uh, for the student and teacher to feel like they are really grounded and anchored in something that's work, working and worthwhile. John, you mentioned uh, teachers doing an emotional check-in. Could mm -hmm. you just elaborate a little more on, on what that means? Yes. I what think that looks like. 
I think there might be nothing more important than this, to be honest. I'm glad you had me highlight this. So uh, it can be literally anything that we're doing to help kids just feel uh, like their emotions matter, right? And so sometimes we'll put like a picture on, on the screen of just like random office supplies. What office supply are you feeling like right now? Gives them a chance to pause what they're doing, go internal, think, okay, I guess I'm a stapler right now because I'm really trying to keep everything together. And then, you know, they share it with someone or sometimes just keep it personal and they move forward. Or we might put up a list of all the different emotions you experience and say, what best describes where you're at right now? Uh, no matter what we're doing, we're giving them that chance, just like we did with the adults earlier, to name what they're, what they're feeling so they can tame it. Thanks, John. So I, I just really have, have one more question for you both. Uh, obviously, while the role of educators is crucial in this process, it takes teamwork with parents to ensure optimal care is taken, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for their child's mental health. So what would your advice be to parents on, on what they can do to make sure, you know, they're bridging the gap between, you know, what they are doing and what their child's educators are doing? Yeah, I think the first thing they could do is first of all, recognize that they are the expert. They're the ones that see their child more than anyone else, uh, especially during home learning, but even outside of home learning. And so just connect with your child, try to understand their point of view, that idea of just slowing down and saying, hey, how is this for you? And then being quiet and listening. Uh, and sometimes our kids will tell us how things are with their words, sometimes through their behavior. And if we notice something that's off, speak up, because I'm sure that there are systems in place for whatever school your child goes to uh, that are meant to support kids who are struggling. So if you notice something, say something. Yeah. And I just add, I'd say, you know, stay informed. Schools put out weekly newsletters. Um, we certainly uh, connect with parents as well. The counsellors will put out newsletters on a regular basis, parenting courses, coffee mornings, but be vocal. We're in a partnership. We want to hear from you. And more than anything, what happens when a parent reaches out to share something that they're having a challenge with, they suddenly realise that they're not alone. They're suddenly realising that these behaviours that they're seeing or experiencing themselves, their natural responses to kind of unnatural situations. And so if we can norm these experiences, that takes off an awful lot of stress from people's shoulders, and it allows them to look at things from a different perspective. And then they can sort of relax a little bit too. And then again, in tandem, we'll figure it out. So the bottom line is, please don't keep anything that you're struggling to yourself. Reach out. We're here to support you. We want to support you. We want to do the best to put your to set your child up for success. That's great. That's probably advice uh, anyone can really take, I, I would say. Uh, so, John, Laura, thank you so much uh, for joining us and, and sharing your, your thoughts, your views, and your experiences with us. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, we hope everyone watching was able to take out a lot of practical nuggets there uh, that they can uh, take home with them. So thanks again, and uh, we, we look forward to welcoming everyone back for the next video that we share. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. Bye-bye.